Welcome to the Global Perspectives 2022 One More Time. My name is Eva Gondor and I'm a Senior Project Manager at International Civil Society Center. For the benefit of blind and visually impaired people, I'm a white woman with dark hair and I'm wearing a light shirt with a dark blue cardigan today. Today, I'm pleased to be your host for the session Getting Ahead, Anticipating Futures for Civil Society Operating Space. I will kick us off with a short presentation of the landscape mapping that we've just published on this topic, as I'd like to share some key lessons from it with you. Afterwards, we'll have a panel discussion and take a deeper dive into the topic with our panelists. You are, of course, invited to share your comments, remarks, and questions in the Zoom chat throughout the whole session. So I'm going to share the screen now so you can see a couple of slides. And I hope they're appearing on your screen. If not, please let us know in the chat and we do our best to, to fix it. So I'd like to share a bit about the landscape mapping uh, that we've just finalized uh, as uh, food for thoughts for, for today's discussion and to also kick us off uh, about, uh, to kick us off on the topic. Uh, I will start with a bit of a framework. So uh, this landscape mapping is a starting point uh, of a project anticipating futures for civil society operating space, a three-year initiative of the International Civil Society Center to strengthen anticipatory capacities and future readiness of civil society professionals who are working to defend civic space and civil society operating conditions. The mapping was written by Heather Hutchings and Danny Vanuki and aimed to look at what civil society organizations are learning from past and present crises that can inform future scenarios for civil society operating space and to identify gaps that require collective sector approaches. It is based on the analysis of existing research initiatives and resources on the future of civic space service with scanning the horizon and solidarity action networks communities of the center as well as qualitative interviews with civil society representatives working on development humanitarian relief human rights and environmental protection coming from international and national civil society organizations as well as from the philanthropy When I talk about learning from crisis, uh, this is the list of crises and trends that was used in the mapping, uh, confirming an agreement on forces impacting civic space, brought up by the interviewees and identified in existing literature. Even though most of the forces are external, such as backsliding of liberal democracy, securitization, climate crisis or disinformation, a few internal ones were highlighted as well as having an important impact, such as internal division and polarization within civil society and demand for the colonization and redistribution of power. Just to make sure we all have the same understanding here, with a crisis, we mean a high turning point or time of intense danger. A trend is a general direction of development over time with the potential to become a powerful change maker. In the report, you can find more details on the list of this crisis and trends, as well as main lessons learned of civil society organizations dealing with them. So there are three key takeaways from this mapping uh, that resonated with me and that I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one is that most civil society organizations are able to respond to sudden crises with their crisis response mechanisms, but there is a gap in understanding and acting on the long-term trends that are underlying this crisis and impacting civic space and civil society operating conditions. In focusing on short-term crises and failing to act on longer-term trends, the sector is failing not only to prepare for the next crisis, but to proactively shape the future. The second key takeaway is that future preparedness is more than trying to predict and mitigate imminent risks. It's the practice of articulating alternative futures 
and taking them from imagination to action. And the third takeaway is that anticipatory capacity is complementary to crisis response mechanisms. It's not about choosing one over another. The sector really needs both reactive strategies to respond quickly to the sudden crisis as they come, and anticipatory strategies to engage with and shape emerging and ongoing trends that change, that change society over time. By anticipatory capacity, we mean skills, systems, and mindsets uh, that enable practice of future thinking and the development of strategies and plans that aim to shape the future. Anticipatory action is then putting these strategies and plans into practice. So building anticipatory capacity and putting it into action is easier said than done, as there are many practical and structural barriers that are holding the sector back from being more anticipatory. These barriers include insufficient and inflexible funding dedicated to foresight and exploration, unequal power relations between international and national civil society organization inhibiting locally led decision making, weak systems connecting foresight analysis to decision making, failing to plan for the unexpected and unknown, and limited practice of learning from each other and thinking together across the sector. An additional culture barrier to building anticipatory action is the so-called crisis mindset that is common across the sector. Crisis response builds on the urgency and can easily dominate time and resources, while long-term anticipatory work is left behind. Giving priority to crisis response has diverted attention and energy from internal transformations in some civil society organizations, for example, distracting from difficult decolonization conversations. Additionally, there are the so-called future skeptics, the colleagues who question the value of investment into anticipatory action and argue that it diverts time and money from actual crisis response. They further highlight that there is a lack of evidence that anticipatory action is effective in defending civic space. If the future skeptics are part of the leadership team, this might be a huge barrier to embedding anticipatory capacity within the organization. So a final point that I'd like to share is an interesting point that was raised in the mapping, questioning if crises are actually meeting a need for the civil society sector. Civil society organization might, might even benefit from the crisis. For example, as responding to crisis reaffirms the relevance of civil society or makes a cause for the fundraising. So the question is, is the civil society sector itself creating an unconscious barrier to thinking beyond the crisis? I finished my presentation here because I'm sure you are also interested in hearing from our panelists, not only from me during this session. At this point, uh, I'm inviting you to read the full mapping, especially the part out outlining what capabilities are needed to strengthen the anticipatory capacity. And uh, my colleagues are going to share the link to this report in the chat in a second. So I'm stopping sharing my screen now. And I hope this quick presentation provided you with some food for thoughts for the upcoming uh, conversation that we'll be having. Some of these aspects that I touch upon will be explored further in a panel discussion, looking not only at what is holding us back uh, from becoming uh, anticipatory, but what the value of anticipation is, and especially how we can get ahead and move from the so-called crisis mindset to anticipatory action. The discussion will be moderated by David Griffith, David is a consultant on human rights strategy and advocacy. He's currently writing about the future of human rights with institutions such as Chatham House and the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. David has an extensive experience working with uh, Amnesty International as director of the Office of the Secretary General or Deputy Director for Asia. 
So David, uh, it's wonderful to have you with us today and over to you to lead us through the panel discussion. Thank you, Eva, and uh, good afternoon from Europe and uh, good morning and good evening to other parts of the world, people joining us from all over. My name's David, as Eva said, um, I am a man. Uh, I have white skin, blue eyes, uh, short dark hair, less of it than I used to have. And I'm wearing uh, a blue and cream shirt and a blue cardigan. Now, I'm looking forward very much to our discussion. Uh, we have a, a wonderful panel and plenty of wisdom to share. And I'm also looking forward to your questions, which will bring this to life. Uh, I'm going to say a few words to introduce, uh, and then we'll hear from our panelists. And then we'll have a chance to engage in the, the interesting Q&A that I know is ahead of us. Now, none of you will need um, reminding that we are living in a world of great complexity and major overlapping crises. Some call this uh, a moment of polycrisis, a word that captures the sense of how big global crises are all impacting and exacerbating each other. We have the climate crisis, the cost of living and the inflationary crisis, the energy crisis, recovery from the pandemic, which is very uneven in different parts of the world, the war in Ukraine and all that that signifies for the global political order. These are huge global transnational challenges. And in response to this instability and complexity, we see how many governments and societies are becoming more insular, more repressive, trying to shield themselves from the chaos and the instability of the world. The global fragmentation and the lack of international solidarity and cooperation is then making it more difficult to resolve these huge crises. And against this backdrop, it's very easy to understand then why civil society organizations are often in crisis mode. Under perpetual attack from repressive governments themselves, fighting for dwindling funds, engaging with skeptical populations, and often experiencing decreasing returns on investments of time and energy, it feels for many of us in this sector like a relentless, endless crisis. But being stuck in crisis mode is not helping. Uh, that's one of the messages from the report that ever has just outlined. Instead of asking how we can shape the future, we are letting the future come to us and simply focusing on being ready for the storm. But, and this is the good news, it can be better than this. And the big question that we're going to discuss over the next hour and uh, a quarter is this. When civil society organizations are focused on delivering under the constant pressure of restrictions and hostility, how can we break out of a perpetual crisis response mode and start to think in a more strategic, long-term way? What would it take to do this? And of course, part of the answer to that question and the aspect that we're looking at today is about anticipation. I just want to reiterate what Eva said to, to um, make sure that it's fresh in our minds as we proceed with the discussion, that futures preparedness within organizations is more than trying to predict and mitigate risks. It's about articulating alternative futures and taking them from imagination to action. So anticipatory capacity, what we're talking about today, is about having skills, systems mindset that enable the practice of futures thinking within organizations and the development of strategies and plans that aim to shape the future. And then of course, putting that into practice. And there are, are three provocations uh, that stood out to me from the report, uh, which I would like to frame our initial discussion about before we uh, go into the Q&A phase. The first of which is that the crisis response mode is actually actively incentivized within our sector. Secondly, the view that anticipatory work is a luxury item rather than a necessity. And thirdly, 
that there is no evidence that anticipatory work is actually useful or effective. Those are three important provocations. Uh, we're going to engage with them uh, and have a very rich discussion with our excellent panel. Uh, we have great wisdom and experience to draw upon. Uh, and of course, we look forward to, to hearing your uh, contributions later on. Let me just introduce the panel before we proceed. Sadly, uh, one, one of the four advertised panelists, Hans Sika, was unable to join us due to um, an, an emergency that uh, drew her away this morning, and she sends her sincere apologies. But we, we have Poonam Joshi, who is Director of the Funders Initiative for Civil Society, or FIX, where she leads the global review that they are carrying out on the future of civic space. Poonam was previously the Executive Director of the Sigrid Rousing Trust and has long experience in the human rights world. She knows this space very well indeed. Secondly, we have Miguel de la Vega, a longtime activist on fundamental rights in Mexico and the wider region, and currently Executive Secretary for Unidos Mexico, a collective of organizations and academics. He's also part of the Global Coalition of Civil Society Organizations for the Financial Action Task Force and a professor at ORT University, Mexico, which is devoted to civil society studies. And then thirdly, we have Barbara Weber, who is Director of Global Impact and Strategy at Amnesty International and formerly leading Amnesty's work on human rights education and before that as the country director in Austria. So, we have uh, plenty of experience to draw upon, as I said. Let's start. Uh, we're going to start with Poonam. Um, thanks for, for joining us, Poonam. I'd just like to ask you, what does it mean to be anticipatory? Why is that useful? And how does it enhance the work that we do? Thank you, David. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation to, to join this um, fascinating panel. Um, I'll describe myself. I am a small South Asian woman with brown skin and wearing black glasses and a black v-neck jumper. Um, so in terms of what it's meant for us in the field of civic space to think about being anticipatory, I think I'll sort of start where we began on this journey to apply a futures lens to this issue. So um, 2019, I was working at Sigrid Rousing Trust, working on um, regions, including the former Soviet Union, Central Eastern Europe, Balkans, Middle East, North Africa, like many other funders, had been looking at these waves of restrictions on cross-border funding and NGOs that had been uh, being proposed and passed for around six years, and then were starting to join the dots to restrictions on freedom of assembly and expression and broader trends around democratic backsliding, and rising authoritarianism. And I think we just sat there going, why are we constantly being taken by surprise? Why are we always on the back foot? Um, we could see that civic space was a problem that was linked to broader trends. Um, and the funding community that I was part of when I joined FIX was saying, look, we, we're all talking about closing civic space, but our responses are very fragmented. Is there a different way for us to look at this? and respond strategically and move beyond sticking plasters on this ever-growing problem. Um, so we undertook a review of um, the future trends that will shape uh, civic space over the next decade. Um, we decided to um, look at a wide range of sectors and movements that we thought were going to be most contested. So we interviewed people working on corporate accountability, climate, AI, tech, intersectional inequality, impacts of climate. And from a sort of trends perspective, we were particularly looking at how the climate crisis and innovation in AI and digital technology was going to intersect with ongoing trends around democratic erosion, deepening inequality, battle over social inequality. And a lot of the language I think many of us use and I can't help using is this sort of military language around sort of battlegrounds and struggles and, and strategy. Um, but I hope what I'm going to say is something slightly more positive. So I think when we entered that process, we were talking about perfect storm of crises and, and, and which feels sort of quite disabling. It was like sort of paralyzing. Um, but there were four key takeaways from this review and process that might help people think about where this sort of becomes useful. 
So I think the first thing was that taking a long-term lens, um, and I'd say that alongside the review we did for FIX, we were working with ICNL on even a longer time frame of looking at civic space to 2040. Taking that long-term lens on crisis and trends was quite liberating, more liberating than being buffeted by short-term challenges, because what it did was sort of create an opportunity to not just spot threats, but also opportunities and envision different scenarios and think about how you could pivot to capitalize on opportunities and not just threats. Um, and futures practitioners we were talking to at the time talked about us entering this extraordinary period over the next decade of disruption, but that also meant that civil society and particularly more radical civil society that had, whose ideas sat on the margins now had an opportunity to move those ideas into the mainstreams as people were looking for solutions to these big grand challenges that were facing us globally. Um, and I have a quote here from Tarso Ramos, who's the director of political research associates in the US that map far right in the US. And he talked about, you know, you can take advantage of the crises that bring opportunity and think about what are the new big bets and to let go of the things that don't work. So how do we sort of start shifting sort of practice, but with a bit more kind of hope about um, what we can shape. The second takeaway was that we might view building anticipatory capacity as a luxury, but those behind driving closing civic space use futures analysis as a necessary tool. So there's a section in the global review where we talk about the playbook of anti-rights actors, and we saw many anti-rights actors or actors implicated in closing civic space, corporations, defense, intelligence, uh, sector and industry, uh, much better at us, uh, us being progressive movements and funders, um, and not viewing it as a luxury at all. And our vantage point often seems to be the end of our strategic plan, even the year ahead. You know, there's a lot of talk in the last decade going, oh, we can't do three to five years strategic plans. Let's just sort of look at what we can do in the year ahead. And that is preventing us um, from mobilizing around shared visions of the future and being as impactful as we could. Third takeaway was around the process, and it's best to explore anticipatory capacity with people outside your sector and discipline. It wasn't something we could have done in silos, looking across all of those sectors, but also looking at experts that sat outside of civil society was really important. And the fourth takeaway was there, is, there was clearly an unmet appetite and need for civil society and funders to come together, um, but very few spaces. For people to do this, um, most anticipatory work is limited to private foundations or larger NGOs that have the resources, and we're going to come to barriers in a moment. Um, one funder network I spoke to, um, who we'd invited into the review and into a convening, said that their work was usually driven by donor agendas and the entire focus was impact, and they rarely got to think freely about the future with people from other sectors, but even having the luxury of not going, well, what are you going to achieve? in this period, why are we wasting our time looking at these kind of broader scenarios? And then just sort of the second bit of what I wanted to talk about was examples of how this could enhance work. And I think I know certainly I, um, I met with David yesterday and we had a long discussion about dystopian futures, which you know some of us find incredibly enjoyable. And then you kind of go, and how do I apply this to my work? <laughs> And often, you know, you have these sessions and people just are completely quiet afterwards and sort of ruminating of the end of their futures. So this bit is to kind of go, well, OK, how do you actually sort of apply this in practice at sort of different levels? So uh, I wanted to give you an example of a conversation I had with a specific organisation during the review. It's a funder that supports LGBTI rights in Eastern Africa. And I asked them what trends they thought were going to impact their work. And they talked about ongoing discrimination and the elections that were going to take place in the region at the time. This is 2019-20. We then spoke about megatrends, climate, digital. And initially, there was a bit of a kind of, but why are you bothering to talk to me about this? I don't see how this is kind of relevant to my work. Um, and, and it was kind of like, OK, well, yeah, we have to help activists with digital security. That's something we do. Climate crisis is going to impact the communities we work with. But sometimes they, you know, something they're going to figure out in their own lives. But then as we sort of carried on that conversation, the person I was talking to started to remember examples of how local leaders in northern Kenya 
had blamed droughts in the region on um, LGBTI persons who moved from Uganda to Kenya to flee the anti-homosexuality anti bill. And they started exploring, you know, that sort of history of the LGBTI community being blamed as vectors of disease. They could now potentially be blamed as sort of vectors of this new crisis. But spotting this early on could mean early opportunities for the LGBTI community to build alliances with climate and environmental rights movements and start shaping what a just transition might look like that was inclusive of that community and not just sort of sitting on the margins and go, well, hang on a minute, how, what happened to us? And this is affecting us personally and, and politically. Um, and we had a similar conversation about digital security and that broader context of Chinese governments exporting tech and know-how that governments are using to repress civil society um, and whether LGBTI communities could be part of some of the nascent work challenging how that technology is being used um, before it becomes a problem. Um, a second example is how anticipatory capacity can uh, enable civil society and funders to shift from reactively to sort of preventative work. And here I'm thinking about the work we do at FIX, looking how um, the UN has set these global norms around counterterrorism and security that over the last couple of decades have led to restrictions on cross-border funding that have fueled demands for tech that gives states unprecedented power to survey and censor civil society. Um, and, you know, how do we sort of move to playing prevention rather than defense? So, you know, the starting point is going, let's look at those mega trends around internet governance, those geopolitical battles over information and the emergence of new technology. Those trends may not be taking place from the perspective of how can governments close civil society, but they will impact us. And we need to be ahead of looking at what those trends are. And then the second stage is then going, where are those norms being set? Where are decisions being made? And we know from mapping those bodies and international agencies that civil society is very rarely in those spaces. So part of it is then kind of going, well, how do we sort of develop uh, an ambitious reform advocacy strategy that anticipates where we need to be and not just be trying to knock on the door of places that have already closed our space. Um, so I can talk about that more in the Q&A. And then the last example I wanted to give of how you can build anticipatory capacity is around the context of narratives and visions. And once again, I wanted to come back to Tarso Ramos at Political Research Associates. Um, the, the interview I did with him was absolutely kind of fascinating. And he was talking about how within the US, they're looking at the far right and the limitations of applying a framework of hate being the fundamental problem with the far right. And he's saying this doesn't address the fact that their goal isn't hate, but power and the power to advance the interests of their communities. And, and we had a discussion about how many of the anti-rights actors that are now in power or in ascendancy actually spent years in the wilderness, but then planning how to build cultural and political power so they could actually sort of pursue their agendas. So if you look at the BJP in India, the RSS, which is their kind of linked movement within the wilderness for around 70 years. And they had a vision of the society they wanted to create uh, and over decades um, engaged in painstaking mobilization. Um, they cultivated communities, they rewrote theology, they mobilized millions um, around a new notion of what India should be. And Tarso talked about how in progressive movements we're losing that fight. You know, we have judicial fights, but we're losing a fight for hegemony. And that this isn't a strategic comms challenge, this is about contesting meta narratives. And you know, for that to have purchase, we as civil society need to be able to come together around shared visions of the future. And so I know this last bit feels kind of very grand, very huge, but we have seen far right, religious right do this. And so there's a question about how we also create space for anticipation not just sort of defense and prevention, but that is kind of quite liberating and allows us to kind of build towards alternative futures. Um, that's it for now. I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. 
Thanks, Thanks, Poonam. That was wonderfully rich um, and uh, many provocations in there and, and also a reminder of the immense strategic power and, and value of this work. Um, for the record, I thoroughly enjoyed our dystopian um, uh, anticipatory conversation yesterday, um, but, but I think I like to think that we did follow your advice and we included uh, a little bit of thinking about hope and opportunities in there as well. Um, I'm going to move on now to Miguel um, to uh, tell us a little bit uh, from your experience, Miguel, what, what's holding us back as a sector from being more anticipatory? How could that change? Hello, David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to describe myself. I'm, I'm a, an Hispanic male wearing glasses uh, and a vest and, and, and a, a clear shirt. Um, well, I want to, to start um, building on something that Poonam uh, said. Sometimes when we uh, encourage people uh, about thinking, uh, about taking anticipatory, anticipatory action, we think about the crisis, we think about uh, the problems that may arise in the future or the trends that we're seeing that may have an impact on civil society. Nevertheless, I share a lot what uh, Poonam said uh, regarding the opportunities. And I guess that's uh, um, a better way to encourage our organizations to think about future and to think about engaging those opportunities. Um, the, the study that uh, Eva just shared uh, already shares some um, barriers to this anticipatory action um, that uh, are key in, in hindering this, the, the efforts of civil society. Nevertheless, there are some other practices that we have identified uh, in, in Latin America and also in other uh, countries in the Global South that have an influence in um, hindering these efforts. Uh, one of the, the, the main aspects that caught my attention when we compare civil society with the work that is done in private corporations is like that it seems, David, to be a, pro, it's a non written prohibition to fail. We're not allowed to fail in civil society. Everybody wants us to be successful all the donors, communities, the boards, our staff, even ourselves are all the time expected to be successful. There is no question if a project is going to be uh, successful or not. I mean, we, we all expect the measure of uh, what's the measure of impact, what, what are the, 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 the deliverables, but what about innovation? What about that type of innovation that uh, generate certain failures, which in turn generates knowledge for the organization and for the uh, civil society sector. Uh, that is very common in, in, in private corporations. Private corporations tend to experiment, tend to innovate by failing, uh, not necessarily on purpose, but failing constitutes a part of uh, creating knowledge and creating, uh, let's say, like an intellectual capital that in turn, helps the organizations to become more innovative in the future. I think that's that's something we need to discuss in, in, in civil society, especially with donors, but also with organizations who are trying to, or, or who are interested in, in, in innovation. Of course, that leads us to um, a previous aspect, I would say, which is the zone of comfort. Many organizations are, uh, who, especially those who have done well in the past, are very confident that the, let's say, traditional practices within civil society, and with traditional practices, I'm referring to governance, I'm referring to fundraising, I'm referring to uh, intervention models, uh, advocacy. Those models may have been successful in the past, but uh, I would dare to say that um, the context that we're facing is very different from 10 years ago and it's changing really, really, if really fast. It's probably changing faster than before. So the fact that, this, that an organization has been successful in the past doesn't guarantee that it's going to be successful in a very different future. And that different future is going to pose uh, risks and opportunities, and as Poonam said, in many different fields. 
politics, advocacy, technology, fundraising, uh, governance, accountability. There are many, many issues in which the world and the context is changing and where civil society can actually feel that globalization is having an impact. Globalization is now felt that something that happens in the other side of the world is just months away to, to, to affect your own organization uh, in the other side. Um, just a couple more points that I would uh, like to highlight is that um, the when we talk about organizational development, institutional development, sometimes that may be a priority for organizations, but the problem is that uh, these uh, efforts for institutional development is put aside uh, in favor of these crisis efforts, this response to crisis. Uh, as you mentioned, David, there's the pandemic, the economical crisis. I mean, so many aspects that affect civil society. And sometimes organizations seem to have their hands so full in order to think about institutional development. Nevertheless, the fact to actually devote time to think about the institutional development may be a way to cope with crisis again. As the study mentioned, and Eva said, and I want to highlight that, uh, one thing is not above the other. They are Those are complementary capacities, complementary abilities that the organization need to understand and prioritize. On one side, of course, respond to crisis, but on the other one, try to understand which are the drivers of those crises. How can we respond? And how can we even try to advocate to change those, those, uh, those uh, trends? And that leads me to a final point that I think is really relevant, which is how can we change the global environment? Sometimes we think that we are just a single organization or a small network, maybe on, uh, on the global south, and then we understand that finally, some of the restrictions, for example, Punam was referring to financial restrictions. Some of those restrictions are derived from uh, policies or recommendations that take place in uh, far away on the other side of the world. They are uh, built by organizations that probably we have never heard of or uh, in, in a very foreign and strange environment. And sometimes that can be really discouraging. That can be like something that is out of reach for our regular organizations of networks. Nevertheless, what the reality is showing us is that when we start articulating and networking in global terms, then change is possible. And I just want to refer very quickly to the efforts that we're doing in the Global Coalition on FADAF. The Global NGO Coalition of FADAF is a, a, a collective of organizations and networks from all around. There are organizations from uh, Tunisia, from Indonesia, from Mexico, from Ghana, from Eastern Europe, etc. And we have all come together to talk with FADAF, with the Financial Action Task Force, something that was unthinkable some years ago. It was unthinkable that a group of NGOs could actually talk to such an international body and try to advocate in order to uh, ask for changes uh, in, in, in a way that um, have a positive impact on civil society and diminish the financial restrictions that we're seeing worldwide derived from uh, the, the combat on uh, terrorist financing. Well, the good news is that it's working. It's actually working. I mean, it's not fast. It's kind of complicated. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, but it's working. FADAF has already agreed in 2016 to revise their recommendation devoted to civil society, recommendation eight. And uh, now it's very much open to other aspects as to, for example, implement a new guidelines on uh, assessing, uh, evaluating countries on including more civil society on uh, training better their own evaluators in order to understand uh, the, the na nature of civil society uh, to, provide, to provide a better assessment 
on the uh, financial situation and financial uh, legal framework on those countries. So uh, I guess my conclusion for this part would be um, the, uh, there are many aspects, of course, that are um, uh, barriers to anti anticipatory actions, but many of those barriers are among ourselves. I mean, we as organizations and our civil society culture sometimes doesn't contribute to, 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 uh, to overcome those barriers. When we think about taking risks, it, uh, try to uh, innovate, even if we fail for generating knowledge, when we dare to articulate and, and, and create networks for global uh, issues that are affecting us all, and when we dare to get out of our comfort zones, then we can, I guess, we can really make use of those opportunities that uh, Poonam uh, was saying. And I believe there are many in, in the years to come. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, again, much uh, food for thought in there. We're going to have our final um, initial provocation from Barbara in a moment, but I'd like to encourage everybody to start thinking about what questions you want to put to the panel. Um, you can start writing them in the chat. We will monitor that uh, and we will come to your questions um, really as soon as they come flooding in after, um, after Barbara speaks. Barbara, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you're in uh, Amnesty International, which is a, a big and complex organization, a family of organizations really. Um, in that context, how, how are you seeing that the organization can build an anticipatory capacity? And crucially, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on how you strengthen the pipeline from sort of abstract anticipatory work through to organizational decision making, strategy setting and resource allocation. So over to you. Thanks a lot, David. Um, and hello, everyone. I start with describing myself. I'm a white woman wearing a dark blazer and an orange t-shirt. Um, David, I love this question um, because I'm quite passionate uh, about identifying the gaps and hopefully also closing some of them between like the abstract strategizing, anticipatory uh, approaches uh, to the very concrete implementation and uh, resource allocation, project development, and so on. Um, and uh, what Punam and, and Miguel said already, uh, of course, we are facing all these uh, things from uh, strategy development where people would say, let's do a one or two year plan and not a big strategy. We can't uh, look ahead. Uh, we are in crisis mode. The world is in crisis mode. And um, also the comfort zones Miguel touched upon, that's not alien to amnesty and the way we work. Um, so I would like to tell you briefly about the journey Amnesty embarked on. When we started developing a new strategic framework, uh, we have now a new framework from 2022 to 2030. Amnesty operates in about 150 countries. As David says, there are many amnesties, not just one. We are quite diverse, quite complex, with many different contexts people operate in. Um, so what you need uh, in your backpack when you embark on such a journey is really persistence, patience, and kindness. Um, because what it is about a culture change, and that came across quite clearly for me in Miguel's and Poonam's statements as well. It is a big change when you want to strengthen a foresight muscle in an organization on all levels while the day-to-day -day business is demanding and our like actual situation sometimes is demanding. It was just uh, the other day with a colleague in a meeting and she said, sorry, I can't concentrate really. The heating is not working properly. Uh, and that really distracts me. And uh, this is for me just like this very concrete barriers, not even talking to politics, but talking our own situations, uh, we have to take into account. And that needs 
uh, a lot of kindness also for ourselves, which we sometimes don't have in the NGO sector and demanding a lot, not seeing what we actually already achieve. So, um, I mean, uh, in system thinking, uh, we are taught that you can't change a culture directly. You need to go through strategy, through uh, polit uh, uh, policies, and through people. And that is something I want you to keep in mind uh, when you listen to what I'm saying. So we embarked on our journey developing the strategic framework with a huge uh, worldwide uh, movement and the global assembly, the highest decision making body in Amnesty actually approving uh, the strategic framework in the end. Um, and we asked a fundamental question, how can we become as Amnesty um, an organization that can actually um, tackle the fundamental challenges that the human rights agenda is facing. We worked with uh, external partners, we worked with uh, Human Rights Lab, gathered staff members and uh, external uh, people to actually look into uh, trends, look into possible future scenarios with uh, different methodologies. We looked at the trends at the deep drivers and many of them were mentioned now already and also in, in other panels um, I listened to from environmental conflicts to hyper-individualism by technology, fueled by technology or the power of co uh, corporations, especially when we talk about technology. So uh, how can you build potential futures? How, how can you look at uh, relative futures instead of one absolute futures and uh, build a, a strategy based on that? Uh, so I think uh, we achieved a lot when developing the strategic framework in terms of integrating uh, possible future scenarios. We have two big global priorities, freedom of expression and civic space and equality and non-discrimination and six outcomes underneath them from uh, gender racial justice to uh, people on the front line of crisis, refugee and migrant rights and so on. Um, but we also integrated like ways of working, becoming an anti-racist organization, working with partners. On all the panels I listened to in this conference, the, the different ways we need to work with partners, the solidarity that is needed uh, facing uh, a, a quite uh, challenging um, situation in the world. This is, uh, these are things we try to incorporate into our strategic framework. Um, Nana, uh, in the opening uh, keynote speech, also made a point about connecting with new social movements. Uh, this needs, for an organization like Amnesty, quite old, um, needs to be humble, collaborating nowadays with new quite successful movements does not mean to put Amnesty first, which we did for, Amnesty, uh, for, for many years, but it it is really about also changing who we are and how we work, um, which is a huge change uh, process and not an easy one. So in terms of what Miguel said, innovating, uh, being able and, and having an, uh, like creating an environment where you can fail, these are all things where you have to create such a culture, otherwise you can't uh, succeed with what, uh, what you want uh, to achieve. So uh, this extensive process, developing the strategy or the strategic framework rather, was just a first step. And what I said at the beginning about being passionate about this gap, so now it's all about delivering on the strategic framework, actually implementing it and ensuring that people can own it and are really owning it. And I have a favorite quote from, from Tracker, for many years it accompanies me, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Our culture started eating our strategy already and we are one year into the new strategic period. So for me, it's really about this persistence and I will give you uh, six points um, that I find helpful or six elements that are important. Um, to actually ensure we are implementing and we are closing some of the gaps between anticipatory approaches and the actual day-to-day -day business. 
First, data-driven decision-making. We are analyzing our action plans every year, and we are ensuring that we are pointing out what do we want to achieve and where are we at and where are the gaps so that it's not talking about our perceptions, but about data. Capacity building, also mentioned in many se sessions, and yes, it's used for everything. So just do capacity building and everything will be solved. Obviously not, but it needs capacity building to switch from an activity-oriented planning approach to a theory of change incorporating relative futures, which is something that needs a lot of know-how. It's not just done easily. Uh, working with champions using foresight methodology, we have them, we have to identify them, then we have to learn from them. Working with new teams. So seize the moment. If in a big organization, a new team starts, that's a moment to establish new ways of working because they don't have their ways of working and they will not tell you we have done this um, like that for many, many years. So we continue doing it. Hiring uh, new people means ensure you bring planning and foresight skills into that. So always have a question about that uh, in your interviews and uh, disrupting ways of working. So challenging existing uh, narratives and framings like tech positive uh, futures instead of dystopia. Um, possibilities, positive uh, change and signs of change instead of shrinking space for civil society, as actually Nana and Wolfgang uh, did in their opening session really well. Um, so I will leave it here. That's the six concrete points we are using to actually bridge the gap. And I can see David is, is uh, happy to move into the next round. Um, so uh, yeah. I'm, I'm here to answer questions and I'm curious uh, what, what the next questions are. Thank you very much, Barbara. And thank you for um, making, making this real. We've moved from the abstract to the more concrete. Now is really the opportunity for all of you to ask your questions. I see a couple have come in already. I'm just going to get the conversation started. And uh, in the meantime, you can think of your own questions Please just type them in the chat box and I will come to them very shortly. Barbara, I just wanted to ask a, a follow up question to you first. Um, in, in an organization like Amnesty, which is full of researchers and campaigners who are looking at the world and trying to make sense of it, everybody is doing this kind of anticipatory work anyway. It's just part of the routine of trying to understand what what we're dealing with. So instead of viewing anticipation futures work as a sort of luxury item that belongs somewhere else that's a luxury, how how can an organization capture that sort of mass of anticipatory thinking that is happening in you know hundreds of brains every day and and to sort of integrate that into the strategic workflow if you like. Mm. Um so there are obviously there are many many ways to do that and um what i think first of all i don't think everybody is doing this anyways uh because many people are not doing it um but they they feel they should so this is a chance for us to actually uh work with them and as i said it's it's a mix of inviting them to build capacity um create learning spaces what miguel said about failing i'm 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 quite keen to establish also as part of our culture um we have a huge impact and learning week next year with the whole movement so it's a mix of uh actually uh making it uh tangible um in workshops in in spaces where people can reflect and create a space where you have to step back where you can't uh do crisis mode uh it's impossible in my experience when i work with teams when they are in an acute 
crisis mode, you cannot start working on anticipatory approaches with them. Let them do their thing. So come in when you have the opportunity, when you can create the spaces. And uh, I just talked the other day with our tech team, uh, uh, which I think they are doing uh, really well in terms of anticipatory approaches. Why, why are you able to do that? And it's for them, it's really uh, brushing their teeth doing anticipatory work, uh, it's part of their nature, it's part of their everyday business and, and, and culture. So learning from them, how can you make it part of uh, weekly meetings, uh, of your retreat? How can you make sure also to have uh, interesting uh, methodologies, uh, create the newspaper of 2030 as we did in the strategy process, do something creative to get people out of their uh, um, conflict and crisis mindset. These are just a few ways uh, how to do that. There are many more. Thank you, Barbara. That's uh, that's good practical stuff. We've got uh, questions uh, starting to come in now, so I'm going to go straight to those instead of asking my own, as many as I have brewing in my mind. Um, really interesting one um, from Alan Fowler, which was the, the first question we had. To what extent is making culture and capacity more future oriented on uh, dependent on reforming the internal lexicon, um, language and external communication. How, how much of this is about sort of the way that we talk? Miguel, I wonder if you have any reflections on this question. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. I think that's a, that's a great question. And there's, a, there's some colleagues who are uh, working on what uh, Barbara mentioned, which is trying to uh, reframe uh, what, what we are referring to and trying to creating a different mindset on thinking about the, the future. Uh, I believe that's that's key because sometimes, uh, especially in, in, in the latest context, when we uh, were uh, working in the middle of a pandemic, the future seems so bleak that the mindset in organizations was really, really pessimistic in, in many organizations that I know of. Uh, it was like a, 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 um, an environment on which there was uncertainty all around. Most of the possibilities seem negative. And uh, it was until later on that we saw that the ways in which we cope with the crisis actually created some opportunities. Uh, but just to mention something very quickly, I mean, when two years ago, these types of uh, panels, international panels uh, through Zoom were not that common. It was kind of difficult. We all had to take planes and move somewhere in order to have this. So I, I believe that when we actually reframe in this lexicon, in the language, when we reframe the future about, let's find out about opportunities. Let's see where this innovation leads us in positive ways. Let's um, uh, actually, we end up uh, putting the organization in a path to actually create trends instead of being imposed trends, which is a very different mindset. When, when your organization is actually thinking about uh, the innovation, you are creating the future. You're contributing to the creation of the future. I believe this question, Alan, is, is putting is fundamental. It's, it's actually a very, very different mindset in which you take ownership of the future in which you can not only innovate, but also innovate for others, and learn to, from others and try to, to, to advocate and influence others. And as, well, as I was just mentioning also something in, in, in the chat, many of these innovations, uh, you don't have to invent it yourself. There are many, many great uh, experiences uh, that we have seen in the global south of organizations and, collective, which, uh, and collectives, which are already trying to innovate in many, many practical fields, as some other colleagues were referring. Practical fields such as uh, new ways of fundraising, new legal structures for civil society, alternative governance uh, design, for example, uh, new ways to promote accountability. I mean, there are practical experiences that are already happening in those organizations that are daring to change 
their 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 references, their narrative for a more future ownership uh, oriented. Thanks, uh, Miguel. Um, lots, uh, a few more questions uh, coming in now. And Poonam, I'd, I'd like to ask you um, if, if you could um, address the, the couple of questions that Tosca has asked, which are really about where do you kind of optimally put this work on building anticipatory capacities and, and thinking about the future within an organization? What, what's the right sort of organizational structure that you need to put around this work to get the best out of it? I hope that's a fair summary of your two questions, Tosca. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there are other colleagues who could sort of talk more to where this sits within international organizations, but I can sort of tell you how we're approaching it at FIX. Um, so on our side, we've, we've made a sort of organizational wide commitment to everybody being trained in how to apply anticipatory capacity to all of their work. Um, I think, Miguel, where you were just pointing out here, there isn't a sort of neat division between program and the actual organization itself and its ability to sort of pivot to the future. Um, so for us, you know, we could have programmatically decided that this muscle sat with me. Um, but you basically have somebody thinking about these approaches sitting within a very traditionally run organization. So I think when you're sort of looking at those larger organizations, I think. Absolutely, in terms of um, accountability, we've certainly seen kind of models of people creating kind of working groups or task forces. But I think, you know, as with any any kind of change that you're trying to drive through an organization, so I've got lots of experience of challenges around gender mainstreaming. Um, I wouldn't suggest that you're accountable to one person. You would need a sort of cross departmental working group. That takes responsibility. You need sort of mechanisms of accountability. Uh, you need timeframes. You need to be able to track sort of progress. Um, and so I certainly wouldn't see it sitting in that kind of one department, that one person who is kind of innovative, but very limited in what they can do if they're trying to do this entirely by themselves, both without sort of strong support from leadership but also just a sort of question mark from people who are just sort of engaged with their day-to-day -day work and going, why are you making me do this? Or this is very interesting, but I don't have time to do this. Um, so I think the other thing I would say is about process is how do you actually create time, space for capacity building and then enable people to move um, using that anticipatory approach into sort of applied practice in their work. Um, so yeah, that's that's in relation to Tosca's question. Thank you. I, I know Barbara was anxious to come in as well. Absolutely, and I could not agree more with Poonam. Um, so I think uh, there is a danger uh, to uh, establish this as something new and fancy. So it sits with a specific department. Maybe you create a new department or uh, the innovation labs of this world. Uh, but if you do not manage to integrate that in the everyday business of all of your teams, when they plan, when they do their projects, um, it will not last. So uh, I would be careful. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't have innovation labs. So you, you can have interventions uh, that um, give people a sense uh, how it feels, what, what the difference is, um, and give them a taste of it. But rather than making it something fancy, it's really, for me, it's this brushing your teeth thing. You do it every day and every team just learns how to do it every day. It's not something fancy, it's you need it, otherwise you're not healthy in this case as an organization. If you remember one thing from this panel, remember the importance of cleaning your teeth and doing anticipation, uh, both, both are essential for a healthy life. Um, we have had a couple of questions about collective foresight. Um, and Miguel, I, I'd like you to reflect on, on those, please. Um, what One question came from Pierre Olivier, which was that we need to be humble and admit that we can't anticipate everything because the, the reactionary forces that we're often up against are very creative. Um, and so this 
it's it's a it's a sense of being perpetually ready um, to respond to crises. But how can we uh, use foresight as a way to perhaps strengthen synergies and coordination? And Abid uh, Gulzar has asked, is this the right time to start thinking of a collective effort to generate evidence for anticipatory work? You you started talking about that in your initial intervention. So if if you could respond to those questions, that would be great. Yes, uh, David, thank you. Uh, the first one, uh, the one that Pierre shared, um, I, I agree, of course, there's, um, it's impossible to, to identify all the trends and the crisis are going to continue coming, that's absolutely agree. Nevertheless, there's, um, um, when we work on, 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 when we develop anticipatory work, we can try to diminish the impact of those crises and even try to get an advantage from them. Some of them uh, are not so, um, I wouldn't say easy to identify, but there is some science also in the past on what's going to, what, what could be the potential effects. And I just referred to something very quickly. Um, when we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, there's uh, the talk that we are already facing another revolution in, in, in the work as the one that we as the ones that we have faced in the past, like the computer revolution or the steam engine revolution in the 19th century at the beginning of the 20th century. When that happens, there were some effects that may be repeating now. There there's going to be changes in the working culture, there's going to be changes in labor, there's going to be changes probably in the legal framework that are going to affect us all uh, with, with, with these changes that are going to occur. That has already happened and we have seen some of the effects. Then we could now identify some of the effects that are going to happen Next, the same happened with the pandemic. When we saw what happened with the wrongly called the Spanish flu uh, in the 20th century, there were also some effects about economic downturn, about uh, unemployment, about certain um, uh, health measures that, of course, were not exactly the same, but they were uh, uh, they, they constituted a certain advice from the past of what may happen in the future. So I believe that's a good opportunity in order to diminish the risks, but also to try to enhance our efforts to identify which opportunities could be there for organizations in order to uh, adapt more quickly and even take advantage for it. Um, then on the, um, on the second question about what uh, Abid is saying, Yes, I guess uh, it's we're absolutely on time uh, a bit to try to generate collective efforts in order to, to generate this evidence. And there's already good uh, collective efforts. I just mentioned very quickly two of them. One is the Ringo project, which is an initiative that is happening globally as well, in order to work with INGOs. What they are doing is trying to first build a, collect build a collective diagnosis of what's going on with, with the trends on INGOs and their work with local communities and CSOs. And of course, they have identified a lot of negative stuff, but also important opportunities, like opportunities to decolonize, opportunities to create more local ownership of projects, opportunity to build locally led initiatives in which uh, the communities and not the donors are the ones leading the change, for example. So there's already some initiatives in that way. And uh, in Latin America, what we did uh, just a, a year ago also was, was to try to identify which were some of the trends, in this case generated by civil society, uh, in order to build practical innovations. And we've, what we found in the Global South is that there were already some organizations experimenting, for example, on creating uh, governance structures that were less uh, vulnerable, less fragile to government control, government harassment, and even were more flexible to work even on restrictive environments. 
So there are some organizations working on that. We also found that there were uh, there was a, there were funders that were experimenting on providing donations to uh, non uh, I would say organizations that didn't exist legally but exist de facto. I mean organizations that that uh, couldn't exist on paper or couldn't exist legally because of the heavy restrictions that some countries face. This could be the case of Libya, for example, Egypt, Nicaragua, and Latin America. But they continue working. They continue working on informal structures, on informal networks, and they were already donors open to fund those types of organizations. Which is very, this is really interesting because we're already starting to collect evidence that innovation is happening that is this this type of uh, crisis are creating opportunities and but we need to continue collecting more and more evidence last one for example in in in, in africa uh, our colleagues in in waxi have identified also uh, they their site is really relevant in order to identify some publications in which they have uh, managed to label some trends regarding, for example, uh, not, uh, not only fundraising, but create a creation of resources uh, on a mixture of uh, commercial activities and social activities in Africa in order to become less dependent with, uh, with foreign funding or uh, government funding. So innovation is happening. Whether we want it or not, innovation is happening. Uh, and it would be really relevant to create more documentation and more knowledge uh, around it. Thanks, uh, Miguel. Great to have those concrete examples. And Punam, continuing this theme of uh, you know the bringing bringing collective power to to this task, um, a good question from John at the World Bank, uh, which is really about how how we can build cross-sectoral interdisciplinary capacity for anticipation. Um, have you seen that happening? What would that look like? It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, which I was sort of grappling with. I mean, there are certainly existing multi-stakeholder initiatives taking place around, for example, the impact of digital technology on human rights or civil society or, or society more broadly. Um, I think there is this sort of question of if you're talking about anticipatory, I, I, the question that immediately came to mind was around power and values. And so who, who is it that's coming to the table? Um, and is this kind of a really sort of diverse cross section of perspectives? Because um, I think at the heart of anticipatory capacity is, is the need to be kind of provoked and challenged about your sort of worldview. So I think for this to work, to be really effective, it would take people with different values, different sort of world views. And then there's a question about what you sort of collectively get out of the process. Um, but I could see, uh, you know, even sort of governments and corporations are not monoliths. And so there will be kind of allies within those institutions and bodies um, that's kind of sympathetic to some of the goals of civil society. Um, so I think, I think there's definitely a gap. I haven't come across um, this kind of engagement. I think civil society would benefit enormously from being able to draw on the many years of experience that governments and corporations have around this. Um, and, and I'd be you know, interested to hear from John if there would be kind of interest from the World Bank in 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 sort of setting up a dialogue like that. Great, yeah, that's a there's an invitation for a, 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 what could be a very interesting, productive follow up there. Um, Barbara, one one for you that's uh, come in from Deborah, which I think is building on this idea of anticipation as cleaning your teeth. Um, what does it look like to do it every day? Uh, two, two minutes, morning and evening? Um, not even only mornings and evenings. You walk uh, through the world, your, your own world. You go to the supermarket and at the checkout, uh, you don't have a person anymore, but a machine and you do it yourself. Welcome to the fourth industrial revolution. That's a weak signal of change. 
So collecting and being aware of these signals of change is part of building your foresight muscle. That's an uh, anticipatory methodology you can do all the time, everywhere, wherever you are. Just have a look around you and see the, the signals and then make sense of that and what it might mean for your own work. So uh, and this needs to be trained. That's why I'm talking uh, about the foresight muscle. Um, it is something that does not come naturally to, to us. Day-to-day -day also means with your team, as I said, in team meetings. Ensure this is a, an agenda item. People can contribute. Uh, ensure at your retreat, you invite external and internal speakers who help you with foresight work and help you thinking outside of the box. So uh, in terms of coalitions, also uh, colleagues of mine I talked to who are really good at that said, we are thinking about inviting science fiction writers because they do futures all the time. So uh, think outside of the box, have partnerships that are not the usual ones uh, in order to build uh, the day-to-day -day foresight muscle. Brilliant, wonderful uh, suggestions there. And uh, I'm sure there are many science fiction authors out there who are now trembling at the thought of all the invitations that are about to flood into their inboxes. Um, Poonam, I, I just want to finish with, with a last question for you, um, which is, do we spend too much time thinking about threats instead of opportunities? Can I answer the easier question first, which is I can give you a recommendation for a, a science fiction author who works on futures for human rights, John Pfeffer, and I'll, I'll share the uh, details in the chat. It's a, it's a, I think it's sort of going back to the question of sort of partly sort of language. I mean, the reality is that civil society organizations, those working on human rights are constantly facing threats. That is the reality of the environment in which we're operating. And if we sort of pivoted to purely talking about opportunities, it would be kind of very detached from reality and almost like sort of we drunk the Kool-Aid of consultants to sort of do a sort of positive spin on everything that we do. But I think the challenge is that we often think too much about threats in the short term. And so I think the point that I was making at the kind of very beginning is, is how do you take that longer term view where you have the sort of, I know mean, we've called it necessity, but the sort of luxury of applying your kind of imagination to sort of explore alternative futures and have, have goals to work towards together with others that actually inspire you. I think the challenge of looking at crisis in the short term feels very disabling and it sucks up all of your energy. Um, and, you know, uh, when Miguel was talking about the work on FATF, when you have those waves of NGO restrictive laws coming at you, you don't have time to sort of pause for breath. And a sort of very practical example of what it means to go from sort of threat to opportunity, I think I posted in the chat where a number of us have been funding coalitions that might come, up, come together initially around a threat, but start looking at the regulatory environment, start looking at the bigger picture, and in that process, um, start developing shared, um, very sort of concrete visions about the future of civil society and civic space that wouldn't exist if they were just sort of working from one NGO law to the other. Um, so I think it's more about the, I think we have to look at threats and this is the daily reality of what we face, but it's around the kind of, I think, time frame around which we consider threat that we could change. Wonderful, thank you. Um, although I'm sure we could easily continue um, for the rest of the day, uh, unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. Um, from toothpaste to science fiction, we've had a, a, a fantastic um, array of metaphors and, and a wonderfully enriching panel full of wisdom. Uh, so thank you very much to all three of you for what you have shared. 
Um, I'm just going to finish very quickly with a provocation, a challenge, and a, and a piece of hope. Um, the provocation, I think, uh, that really strikes me from what we have heard um, over the last hour and a half is that this long-term thinking is liberating. It helps us to escape from um, a, a really repressive and oppressive cycle of dealing with crises and problems all the time. Um, that, that analogy that Miguel brought um, about how anticipatory work is a little bit like R&D in the private sector. Um, the challenge is there. Can we, uh, you know, within this, uh, th this question, can we look beyond our own strategic frameworks um, and the crises that we happen to be in at the moment and start to embrace the, the liberating potential of looking into the much longer term future? The challenge, uh, I think, facing us is how do we incentivize failure? We've talked a bit in this panel about how all the incentives are towards uh, conservatism and doing the things that we know um, uh, that, that we've tried before, whether they work or not. Um, but can we create organizational cultures where experimentation is rewarded? Um, and how, how can we learn from each other? Um, and, and that metaphor that Barbara used again, how do we build that foresight muscle, uh, recognizing that it's not just gonna come out of nowhere, but it needs real uh, investment, it needs real fueling. And finally, a piece of hope, uh, which Miguel brought to us right at the beginning, which I think is that collective power brings us hope. Um, each of us in our own work and in our organizations looks at the overwhelming complexity of what we're dealing with, but there's tremendous creativity, power, uh, intellectual uh, resources, um, wonderful experience um, and creativity across our sector. How can we really come together around looking uh, long-term into the future and trying to imagine and build the world that we want? And, uh, it, and, and to do that in a way that, that Poonam described, where we're challenging our own paradigms and values. How, how can we imagine a world in which power is transformed. Can we do it? That is the challenge that we leave you with. And back to you, Eva. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, uh, for well moderating uh, this discussion, also finishing with some provocations to take to the next level, as well as a piece of hope. Thanks a lot to our panelists, Barbara, Puna, Miguel. Uh, it was really fascinating to hear about your work uh, experience and practices. And uh, I already know that I'll be thinking about uh, anticipation when brushing my teeth uh, this evening. So thanks a lot for putting this into my head and uh, really thinking, uh, what did I do for anticipation on each day uh, while brushing my teeth? Well, we really hope uh, that also all the participants that are with us on this call uh, enjoyed the conversation. And thank you really very much uh, for staying with us till the end. I mentioned at the beginning that Anticipating Future is a three-year initiative of the center. And we've just finished its first phase with conducting uh, the mapping that we were talking about, the International Civic Forum uh, that we convened early this month, and this panel discussion at the Global Perspectives. As the next step uh, in 2023, we'll focus on developing future scenarios for civil society operating space. And afterwards, we really look at translating them into uh, concrete strategies. So if you are interested in learning more about this project or getting involved, uh, follow the center's website or send me an email uh, to discuss it uh, further. <laughs>